Yay. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. Today we got uh, Mr. Mark Wagenspiel. Uh, I'm Jim McGuire. Uh, Mark's there waving, so he's in a good mood this morning. So anxious to uh, to educate everyone that's on the line, as well as myself, as always. Uh, today, Mark is going over the model analysis and denture setup principles. Before we get going with Mark, there's a couple things that I want to just cover. Your phone is going to be on mute. So if you have a question throughout the program, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see this uh, panel. And within that panel, there'll be a question box. Go ahead and type in your question. And I'll either answer it during the program or we'll save it to the end because we also have a question and answer session at the end. So uh, again, if you have questions, send those through and we'll go from there. Uh, the recording, uh, we will have a recording of this that you can visit on our line, on our social media uh, and other various um, topics that are listed on there as a uh, recorded webinars and videos. Uh, so you can go to the Instagram, the LinkedIn, the uh, YouTube, uh, Vita North America YouTube channel, Facebook, et cetera. And again, we have all sorts of different uh, recorded webinars and videos uh, that you might be interested in. So the other thing will be that uh, CE. Uh, CE is going to be uh, sent to you. You'll get an email. Uh, from our education department and once you get that you'll have to respond to that and then if you have a, a You know take us a couple days to, to process all of them Usually we have a, a pretty full webinar uh, So there are several hundred people registered to uh, attend and then we just have to get through that and the education department will uh, process those accordingly So mark you've been uh, you've been well Yes. Healthy? Yes. All right. Excellent. Still here. Excellent. So th we're going to, this webinar will be on, uh, on, what, an hour, hour 15 or so, uh, whatever time it takes, and including the questions. Uh, so we have Mark all this morning. Uh, I want to just go over a little bit about Mark. Um, Mark's a, a Vita Global Certified Trainer for Vita, Germany. Uh, management consultant as well. He's a licensed insurance, uh, which makes him kind of a, a wet finger technician, if you will, which is great for us um, technicians that are trying to either learn or expand our education on uh, dentures, because Mark's going to give us a, a perspective from his and on from the beginning all the way through the end, you know, how to fit the dentures, you know, what does your dentist or if you're a dentist and you're online, you know, from your side, your perspective, what does that mean, right? When a, when a, um, a dentist or a denturist is asked to reset the teeth, why was that? Why, you know, what the causation and so forth. So Mark gives us really good insight on how to prevent remakes, redos, resets, uh, and to help us, um, really do less spot adjustments uh, for the, um, uh, the the occlusion and so forth. Mark uh, owns and operates Heritage Denture uh, Center in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, he, it's his own denturist practice. Uh, spent his career focusing on how dentures integrate into the mouth and body. And he, he inspires a, a unique awareness of occlusion and professional growth of technicians, dentists, and other denturists. So at this time, I'd like to present uh, Mr. Mark Wagenseal, and I will remove my mug from the uh, from the presentation, and I'll get you as the presenter, Mark. Awesome. You are all ready, Mark. Show my screen. Nice. Okay, Jim, you can see me. I can. Everything looks good. Awesome. And can you see yep. the um, the PowerPoint? I can see your PowerPoint and you. Awesome. Technology. So it's actually working. 
you know, yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, I'm moving myself over. All right, then. Okay, good morning, everyone. Woo, woo. <clears throat> Welcome. Hey, thanks for taking time out of your busy day. Really appreciate it. Thank you for investing in yourselves and in patients that trust you, whether you're a direct provider for dentures or whether you're a technician, it doesn't matter. There's a patient at the end of that thing that is trusting everyone in the process to look after them and wanting people to be their superhero. Patients want to eat. So thanks for taking time and investing in yourself. Thanks for hearing me out. Let's begin our journey. All right, what are our common denture issues that we experience? Denture teeth chew well with a new denture. New dentures more loose than the old set. Mark, my new dentures fit worse and are more loose than my old ones. Yeah, has anyone ever heard that before? Multiple relines with no success. Denture base breaking. Food collects under the denture, but a reline isn't warranted, and the new denture feels too big. Soreness, pressure points, and the temporary implant denture is preferred over the permanent one. Those are always fun. Why does that happen? Look, I spent, uh, I'm 51. I started caring for patients and started in this profession uh, when I was 17. And I'm a denturist and a dental technician here in Alberta. I carry two licenses. And I, I must have spent about the first 10 years of my career banging my head on a wall going, why isn't this working? It's supposed to work. My bite's right. And everything that school taught me to do checks out. And patients coming back and they still have complaints and still things don't work. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating for us and it's frustrating for the patient. And it, it's difficult at times. These are our common denture issues that happen. And we've all been faced with this. Uh, especially when a denture base fractures within the first, say, two to three months, or the denture teeth are chipping on the first two to three months of insert, um, especially that comment of my, my old denture fits better than my new one. Uh, that's, those are always fun conversations to have with patients. So th this is a, a, a moment for me to do a little bit of PowerPoint with you to give you some context and, and build a little bit of a foundation, and then we'll get into setting some teeth today so that you can see it. These common issues cause us stress, and that stress built up over your professional career starts, and, and, and it can make you jaded. Um, it can make you fall out of love with your profession and with what you do for a living. Uh, it causes us stress, um, and especially those of us that have to deal directly with a patient. You have a, a patient that's older than you in most cases that is not happy, and those are difficult, uh, stressful, and critical conversations to have with people. So. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, that stress and, and now how we can bring it down and, and, and change it so that you have a happier professional career and you can have more consistency. And this is about consistency for us. So I, I want to talk a little bit um, again about the, the whole pie. Dentures are like a big tort and that tort is made up of many pieces. So I'm going to flip around and talk a little bit about all of those pieces so that when you set teeth, you can understand, geez, why do these things work the way they do? So first off, I want to talk a little bit about the material. Uh, Vita teeth are 85% polymethylmethacrylate, 14% inorganic filler, and 1% shade. What's the inorganic filler? That's silica. Silica, by definition, is quartz, by definition. So they have glass particles in them. A couple of things about that. Why is that important? Number one, glass looks like enamel. So it gives more of an enamel presence. Number two, they're stronger than regular acrylic. And number three, because of the glass, you don't have to polish it if you grind the surface. So that's a big one for us, because if you grind regular acrylic teeth, you have to polish it gently afterwards, or you leave it rough. This is self-polishing. So that's a big deal for us, is that we don't have to repolish it afterwards. So that was why I wanted to put, put the picture of the screen up here of, of the material so that you see that it's acrylic glass. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that it has a lower burn temperature as a result. You've got to be careful when you flame it. So when you're using a, a micro torch like this, you've got to be careful 
uh, when you flame it because you'll burn it. So other than that, it, it has this characteristics of enamel and you don't have to polish it. Uh, the Vita teeth all come with opalescence in them. And, and again, that's our money shot of enamel. And that's like the scales of the fish. So Vita has put opalescence uh, and opal into the product to, to again, give it that characteristic of enamel. Okay, so again, under light, Vita teeth also have fluorescence, so under black light. Um, and, and the black light just makes it pop a little bit quicker. So you can see that the left teeth glow, the right teeth don't. So left is Vita, right is dense supply. And you say, well, Mark, I, <laughs> who wants their teeth glowing? Um, well, the problem is, is and not the problem, the, the point is, is that we use the black light to really enhance it. But you have to see that the teeth under regular sunlight, fluorescent light, they need to have characteristics and they need to have depth and character to them. Uh, now at, at, at again, 30, 34 years of doing this, no patients ever walked into the office and said, hi, I want a fake looking set of teeth. Um, sure, they might want it light. Sure, they want a light shade. Um, sure, they maybe want some things corrected in terms of they want things just to have a nice smile, but they don't want it to look fake. So what's important here is that Vita teeth are not mirror opposites of each other. A lot of manufacturers, left side, right side, et cetera, are all mirror opposites. These are not, even though they belong to the same set, there's slight character differences in them. And that's done on purpose so that it helps break up the light and make it look more like it belongs into a person. So again, coming back to the fluorescence, they have phosphorus in them and Vita puts phosphorus so that the teeth have more character so that they look alive and not dead in the mouth. Enamel has it, that's why Vita puts it in. Uh, Vita teeth also have the golden proportion. So a golden proportion is like a triangle where everything's related to each other. So the, the teeth themselves are all mathematically proportionate. And that's really important to know as well. And then the other thing that Vita teeth have is, quickly, are you on the line? Jim? Are you there, Jim? Hello, yeah. Jim. Yeah, sorry about that. Jim, can you still see me and the PowerPoint? I can, or just, yes. You can, see, you can see me as well? Awesome, wanted yep. to verify I that. I certainly thank can. You. Thank you, thank you. Sorry guys, I just, when it, just with the software, it comes up as I only see my screen uh, and of uh, the PowerPoint. So the other thing that's important for Vita teeth in lingoform MFT and physiodense posterior teeth is they have what's something that's called freedom and centric. And by definition, that's the flat areal in the central fossa, usually of the lower, in which the opposing cusp comes into contact and permits a degree of freedom. And there's a little bit of freedom in it. So a couple of things on that. There is only a handful of dentured teeth on the planet that have freedom and centric built into them. 99% of the teeth that are out there when you touch them into centric and hold them into centric, they are locked in. Sure, they work in balance, but that work in balance begins immediately. There's no little shift or, or, or movement. There's only a handful of teeth that have it. So who has it? Well, Vita does. Lingoform, MFT, and Physioden lines only. Why? Because this is more trending, this is more current, and we forgot about it. We forgot to include it early on. The tooth lines like Cuspy Form, which is what the company was founded on and, and sort of the bread and butter of the company doesn't have that. You hold them into centric, it's, it's locked. It goes into working and balancing immediately. Um, all of dense supply teeth also do, have, do not have freedom in centric. Uh, Ivoclar only, um, Ivoclar only, oh, wait a minute, see what happens where you, it's on the tip of your tongue. Um, Fenaris has it, um, Mertz Dental, uh, only Artigrill has it. So there's only certain tooth lines that have it. And these are tooth lines that are, have been developed more recently in time. Uh, 20 degree teeth and, and such cuspy form, um, the, the very beginning tooth, tooth lines that these companies came up with back in the 50s, that's all from 50s theory. You guys, it's not 1950s anymore. You don't use a cell phone from the 50s. So it's time to get with it and, and, and start using denture teeth that have more trending and, and more trending technology and more trending theory in them. And that's the freedom and center concept. 
So what's the real life example? Well, hold your teeth together, and I want everyone to touch your teeth together and center it. And now, before you go eccentric, try to wiggle them in centric. So gently, try to wiggle them in centric before you go eccentric. So that wiggle, that little, little, little bit, it's about a millimeter dim and centric. Now, everyone, I'm going to introduce you to what's now internationally known as the wagon seal wiggle. And for those returning, you know who you are. And everyone do the wiggle. And that's freedom. And freedom, everyone, is good. Especially our returning guests, freedom is good. Woohoo! Woo so we do not slap teeth together. What's important is we forgot about freedom and centric. We forgot that there's a little bit of give in these teeth. There has to be in centric. Why is that important? Okay, so what happens is on the left-hand side, you'll see the picture. So freedom is like a little bit of a helicopter pad to land in. If you don't have a helicopter pad, what happens is, is you hit and slide into position. So when the teeth are going through their cycle, you're asking a patient then to, to move. And because it's locked in and there's no forgiveness in it, if they miss, it hits and slides into position. The hit and slide's what the, what the problem is. Hit and slide causes the fractures. Hit and slide causes the tipping. Even though you have a new impression and the patient says, it's loose when I eat and food goes under it, that's the teeth tipping in the mouth. They're tipping because as they go through their chew cycle, there's a hit and slide into position. I'll develop that comment more as we progress through the PowerPoint quickly. You are asking a senior citizen to bullseye land centric every time. You know that's impossible, right? How does a denture patient feel? They have lost all of their natural teeth. Those natural teeth contained a nerve. That nerve went to your central nervous system. That then gave your brain and your central nervous system real-time response of where your teeth are three-dimensionally in your mouth. So then it always knows to work within that pattern so the teeth don't knock each other and hit each other and function against each other because that real time feedback is going back to your central nervous system all the time. When your teeth are pulled, those nerves are cut and now you don't have that feedback anymore. Now we shove a denture in someone's mouth and it starts to compress on the gum because that's your pressure, that's how it fits. It's pushing on the gum. So now the brain needs time to interpret, what does that pressure mean? wait a minute, where did my teeth go? And wait a minute, what's this thing pushing on gum now? That's new. So the central nervous system needs time to figure that out. When you touch together and swallow, that creates a certain amount of pressure onto the gum. So then your brain learns, oh, that's swallowing, that's centric pressure. Then when that patient eats, there's more pressure put down onto the denture base. And now your central nervous system appreciates, wait a minute, that's chewing pressure. So it's much like when you're sitting, there's not a lot of pressure on your foot. Your foot's on the floor, there's not a lot of pressure on it. Your brain load knows, oh, there's weight transfer onto my foot. So now my brain goes, oh yeah, I'm standing now because I can feel all this pressure on my foot. It's the same idea with a denture. So how does a denture patient feel? Well, they learn to understand the pressure differentiation, the hydraulic pressure, differentiation between centric and chewing. So I used to say to a patient, okay, please touch your teeth together, Mr. Smith. Mark, you idiot. They can't feel their teeth touch together. There's no nerves to the denture. The denture's dead to the central nervous system. So it took me a while to figure out, wait a minute, how do they know their teeth are touching? Well, they can tell it by the pressure change of how that denture base is putting down. So now we've used denture teeth that are locked together in centric. So now how do they tell if their teeth are hitting and sliding into position? They can't. You and I can. You can feel a, a, a raspberry seed in your teeth. You know if your bite's off right away because of that feedback always coming back to your brain. Denture patient can't. So what they feel is the denture base rattling. So we think it's a reline. No, it's the, it's the teeth not meshing properly. So we're asking denture patients to pinpoint and land centric in a bullseye every time. That is impossible to do. Why? Because now you're a senior citizen 
How's your muscle tone? How are the nerves? How is the integrity of the nervous system? Unfortunately, as we get older, things start to degrade. And now we don't have as sharp tone of muscles, sharp tone of, of, the, of the neuromuscular firing pattern of the nerves. Things get a little sloppier. And so now we're still asking a patient to pinpoint land centric every time, which is impossible to do. They can't do it. One, because now we've gotten older, things have degraded, taken the nerves away, and all they feel is the pressure change of the denture base. This is what's important now to understand about the denture teeth and the type of teeth you use matters. Because now that's the hit and slide business. Where now on the right side of the screen, you can see that, again, if it hits and slides into position, it's going to rock the denture base. It's going to damage implants. It's going to damage components. It's going to cause the denture to shift. What's this doing to the gum? It's starting to rub. It rubs the tissue, causes the sores. The hit and slide is the cause of all of our grief. It has taken me, it took me a while to figure that out. Because again, I, I spent my time banging my head on the golf wall going, why isn't this working? Now, so for some people, they adapt to dentures. Again, I've built many 20 degree teeth in my life and, and a lot of them worked and patients understood it. They accepted the denture and sure, maybe it, it was a little loose, but they just tolerated it. And they tolerated the food underneath. Understand that the denture adhesive market in the United States alone, how much denture glue do you have to sell to make $150 million? So that's the solution. People just get the denture and then they go use glue. That's what Polydent says, and all these companies say, you know, fix a dent and such on their commercials, and then they show someone eating an apple. Well, okay. So now this is the problem, and this is the inherent stress in it. We can catch this on the front end, meaning the type of teeth you use matters. So this is what this looks like on an articulator. So now you can see I can wiggle it in centric. There's a little bit of freedom. Freedom everyone is good. So that is now you can see we're going into full working and balancing. That's there. But now there's that little bit of wiggle room. And that's important. So whether or not you use an articulator that has it or not, that's fine you know that the teeth from Vita come with it right away. That's what's creating stability. So that when you go through a chew cycle, now you're giving someone, instead of a bullseye to land on, you're giving them a helicopter pad to land on. That creates the stability. I have virtually eliminated soft lining use in my office. I don't have to use soft liners anymore. Soft liners was always, well, flat gum, use a soft liner. Flat gum means you're more sensitive. In most cases, I have virtually eliminated that use. I don't buy it anymore because I don't have to buy the product anymore because I use it so, so seldom. Because now what is controlling that and causing more better denture integration in the body is that I'm giving someone that helicopter pad to land in. It's really been an eye-opener for me in my career. So I want to talk to you about the chew cycle. So this is patients chewing. So these are real teeth and I want you to look. So we set up teeth and articulator and we go, oh yeah, my bite's right, my bite's right. Take a look at what, how this is going to work in the mouth when you put a denture in your mouth. So although these are real teeth, take a look. So these are natural teeth, but look, it, are they chewing up and down? No. You can see that they come in at an angle. So what happens is you have to be careful because now when they come in, they have to hit and, they, you don't want them to hit and slide. You want them to clear everything so that they don't, damage and that there's a degree of freedom in there and that creates the stability. So look at that, you can actually even see on the video that they come in and then you can see the jaw drift and then open, which means you can actually see the freedom in centric right there. So this is brilliant, okay? So what this tells you is that this is showing you how this is working real time, real life. And now we have to try to artificially reproduce this with a denture. So understand that touching your teeth together and going through that motion, the teeth come together, they touch, they reflex action open. They're not milling the food, they're actually crushing the food. So take a look at this patient, this is really good. So you've seen a couple of examples now, take a look at this true side. Previously it was a little bit more horizontal. So what happens is every person that, that you treat 
whether you're a dental technician or whether you're a denturist, they have a chew cycle. That chew cycle is unique to that patient. It's like your thumbprint. And now you need to make endeavors to try and address that chew cycle. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that because how you set the teeth, now it has to work within that chew cycle. What you're trying to do is not have it hit and slide into position because I can set it up all I want on an articulator. I, I can do that and, and set it up all I want and make it look really good on an articulator. Yeah, get it in the mouth, it's another story because an articulator can't mimic every movement of the mouth, nor can it do it accurately, okay? Meaning that it has to be unique to that patient. The chew cycle is unique to that patient. The denture setup has to be unique to that patient. So what that means is everyone has a chew cycle. You have a more flat, more ovular, ovoid, teardrop, and everybody has different kinds. So how do you identify this? Well, I'm gonna talk directly now to all the direct help the practitioners out there that wet finger that stick their fingers in someone's mouth and for a, for a dental technician these are things that you can actually take this put this on your work order and have the dentist circle what they think the chew cycle is of the person and you have to train your doctors a little bit about it and those are crucial conversations to have but what you're trying to do is wait stop wasting their chair time on adjustments so Let's take a look at this patient. Patient comes in and says, Mark, my teeth are loose. Okay, let's run the video. You can see her lower jaw drops comes forward and sometimes drifts to her left so that on the left side of the screen the anterior teeth are hitting each other which causes the denture to become loose because they're hitting why because remember she can't feel it because she has no nerves now i'm using 66 66 is is a word that we use at a wax trine it's very common so when we put a wax trine in someone's mouth we have the patient usually count from 1 to 10 60 to 70 maybe we have them say the days of the week uh, we have them say maybe Emma, church, these are common words. So we're looking to see midline, smile line, are the teeth on the wet, wet, dry line of the lower lip. And we're looking for aesthetics. We don't use those commands and those words to look at function. They actually also show us function and the chew cycle of the patient. So next example, take a look at this chew cycle. Now I'm having the patient say the days of the week and, and you can have them say the months of the year. What's important with the phonetics of that language? So now you want them to say it in English, and if they have it, a mother language. And then you're watching the jaw. So watch this. Do you see it? Look. You see your jaw move? Huh? That's, man, that's brilliant. Look at that thing. So if I lock the bite in on her, what's going to happen? The teeth whack, wackle around and they, and they move around. That case there, I have five millimeters of overbite on that case. Yeah, you heard me right. I have five millimeters of overbite on that case. But where I, where I have my freedom is I put a lot of freedom and centric in that. There's a lot of wiggle room in there, everybody. And wiggling is good because freedom is good. So that when she goes through and she's posturing like that and her jaw postures, I've made accommodations for that in the setup. And I have to use denture teeth that allow me to do that. So here's another, uh, another. Um, actually she was uh, an attendee in one of the courses and I've uh, colored her bottom teeth there. Now watch her say 66, watch what her jaw does. Can you see a posture a little bit to the left? Look, it comes forward comes forward, postures a little to the left. But look at her teeth. She hasn't chipped any of them. Nothing's damaged, so why? Well, because remember, there's nerves there. Always goes back to the brain, to the central nervous system, so that the brain knows the, the zone or the cycle to function in. Now, if we cut those nerves, we can still do things, but now we have to accommodate for that. So again, you need freedom and centric. 
So these are some examples that I'm using to, sh to show why am I going to show you how to set teeth in, in a bit the way that we're going to do. And again, now I'm going to touch on the, adjust the adjustment rate for dentures typically is two to five times. So a denture patient's in the office two to five times after insertion for an adjustment. So what does that mean to you as a direct care provider or to your doctor? That means most adjustments are about 20 to 30 minutes in length. You got to get the patient in uh, right now, do COVID protocol on them. Um, if they haven't already done it pre uh, online uh, and, and you have to, excuse me, if they haven't already done pre COVID questionnaires, um, you have to check them and then you need to come in, seat the patient, get them in, look at the problem, correct the problem, and then clean the room after. So that's about 20 to 30 minutes in length. So let's do a just rough figuring here. So say for an upper and lower denture, you charge $2,600. Say the lab bill is 700-ish, <clears throat> pardon me, subtotal of 19. Per head runs at about 75%. A lot of dental offices are running higher. Most dental offices are about 80 to 85% of overhead. But let's just use 75. It leaves you a, a profit, the office profit of $475. Two adjustments leaves now a profit of $275 based on about $100 an hour billing time for the denturist or, or the dentist. And actually less if you consider room cleanup because uh, last time I checked, the doctor doesn't clean his own room. And a lot of insurists also their staff clean the room. Um, but if I'm cleaning the room, yeah, I have a billing rate per hour. So now you have to consider that as well. The more adjustments you could have now, all of a sudden you've worked for $75 of raw profit for the office. Well, how does a business make money? How does a business maintain profitability? Period. So if we can cut that adjustment rate down from two to five to zero to one consistently, that's huge. That's huge for a dentures and that's huge for a doctor. I've met a prosthodontist in the US. They schedule 150 adjustments a month in their timetable. 150 adjustments a month for a prosthodontist. You think he's interested to cut that in half or zero to one per patient? This is a big deal, everybody. This costs money and it's time and it's stress. So it's very important. We can do that. Why? By now, we forgot about the freedom and centric business. Again, one adjustment a day at, at say 30 minutes of time, that's 2.5 hours a week, that's 10 hours a month that you work for free. You guys, that's a day. It's a day and a bit. That's a big deal, okay? This is about being profitable. This is about being efficient. So. The dentures, you promise to look up your adjustment rate and count it up, okay? I've seen now enough dentures come through our courses and we've asked them their adjustment rates. Guys, it's substantial of what you do in a month. If you can cut that down, it's a big deal. And if you're already low, then good on you. Dental technicians, go pick your top couple of accounts, two, three accounts that you have, and then track it with the secretary about how many adjustments are being done after the insert. And then go to the doctor and say, hey, in the last three months, we've, done, we've inserted this many dentures, you've done this many adjustments. I have a process that so we can cut that down to zero to one consistently, are you interested? You darn tootin', they're gonna be interested. Yes, I just said darn tootin'. They're gonna be interested on that because chair time is everything. Chair time is where we make or break the case, where we make or break the money, okay? My chair time is gold everybody. That's where you. That's where it's all done. You make the profit or you take the loss and it's in the chair time. Chair time's expensive. That's why, again, uh, staff in a dental office are all, uh, have, if you've noticed, we used to call and confirm appointments the day before. Now they're going two to three days before. Why? So that if a patient cancels last minute, they have time to try to fill that spot so the dentist doesn't stay idle because an idle dentist isn't making money. So you ought to count up your adjustment rate, help your clients, educate them, help yourself, educate yourself about what that is. Remember, one missed dental appointment usually requires two to three more to recoup the cost. That's bread and butter in dental schools. So if somebody misses an appointment, it takes two to three more to recoup that lost fee. 
It's the same for now a denture adjustment because you're not making money when you're adjusting the denture for free. So Freedom and Centric reduces denture dislodgement, reduces friction, ulcerations, provides money and stress, reduces damage. So all those major issues that we see in our careers, this helps. It's been an eye-opener for me professionally. So what does the patient want? Well, they don't want this stuff. They want it to go in, they want it to fit, and they want it to function. At the end of the day, it's got to work, you guys. They have to eat, okay? And more than just mashed potatoes and gravy. So this is a big deal, okay? So look, we have patients, we see patients, I can show you all the pretty pictures you want out there of people that, that are eating and can eat corn. And look, this is just about now quality of life and being a superhero for somebody. So we can build teeth. We can do complicated cases because now we can start to understand how does the mouth work? How does it function? And a little bit about what I'm talking about now in a PowerPoint before I show you the setting of the teeth. Um, in 2019, the World Health Organization listed burnout as a disease. And burnout is basically loss of interest in your career uh, and you become disillusioned. So I've already kind of alluded to that. So when a patient comes in with a locked in bite because we've been using denture teeth that are locked together and we have all these issues and we deal with them on a daily basis, over time that gets us frustrated and you get tired of dealing with, the, with, with it. If we can reduce that, then it creates a better professional happiness for you. So not only is it a benefit for you, but uh, for your patient as well, because then they'll start sending in patients to you on referral because every denture patient knows that typically they get sores with a new denture. And then if you can build it and it didn't get sore, well, wow, you did a great job. This has been, again, a big eye opener. And I've said this repeatedly. I don't bang my head on the wall nearly like I did during the first, again, 10 years of my career, because now the type of teeth to use matters. So I want to be clear here, 20 degree teeth, they're, they're held together. So you, they're touched, they, they lock together in freedom. Excuse me, let's try that again. In three, two, one. They touch together in centric and they work in balance. And when you do a 20 degree setup, you'll tell they're quite interdigitated tightly together. And now I'm going to show you something that isn't. It's got a little bit more freedom and flexibility in it. So not only do you have that freedom where you have that millimeter helicopter landing pad to land in, the, the teeth aren't knuckle tight. Because now that I showed you those videos of people chewing and going through their chewing cycle, you can't have things knuckle tight. Because how is that going to work in the mouth when they're trying to eat? And then again, the brain can't reproduce centric accurately every time because it can't feel it. Again, we forgot that denture patients can't feel their actual teeth touch. So we have to put in that compensation, which is why I don't use 20 degree teeth anymore. It's all freedom and centric teeth. This is important. It's all lingual form from Vita. The company has less stress, have more time. And now I'm giving back to professions that I love by lecturing and sharing this with other practitioners globally, such as yourselves, to say that we can do it better, and then we can have uh, much less stress in our daily lives here and on the work site. So, Vita wants to further their relationship with you, which is why I'm here, and ergo that patient that places their trust in you. This is about, again, providing a better product and being a superhero to a patient. Be that superhero. Cut those adjustments down. Be a superhero to your doctor. These are things that are obtainable. Be a superhero to yourself and your patient. These are the contact representatives. So since we're recording this, you can hit pause now. So this is the Vita reps that are in North America. And if you're watching this outside of North America, then go on to uh, Vita Germany's website and then you can find your country and then get into the proper uh, people that can assist you or send us an email or um, a link and we can um, we can help you out. So uh, now I want to talk about the setup procedure. So if you give me a minute, I'm going to zip out of this program and I'm going to go elsewhere. So one moment, please. And I have no funky hold music for you. All right, bear with me. 
Hi, Jim. Can you jump on the line quick? Yes. So Hi. you just okay. want to yeah, expand it, make it large. Okay. Yep, there we go. We're good to go? All right, nice. Yes. Yep. All right, Perfect. thanks, Jim. Just wanted to make sure that everyone is seeing that. Cool, thank you. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. There we go, hi. Okay, so what did we learn? We learned freedom. So we learned now, teeth are made from acrylic glass. You don't have to polish them if you have to adjust them. Now we talked about adjustments and adjustment rates and that we can cut that down by, by building a product that's gonna fit and integrate inside the body better. How do you integrate it in someone's body better? Well, so that's why I started to tell you. you, they lose their nerves, their nerves degrade as they get older, and so it's less accurate. So your chewing and your degree to find centric becomes less accurate as you get older. And then we need to incorporate that into the denture. So now I'm gonna show you model analysis denture teeth setup so that you can see how this functions in the mouth, so then we can adjust it. So then when it does function in the mouth, and the patient's chewing, the teeth don't hit and slide. The hit and slide is the mother of all problems for us. Because again, the patient can't feel it hit and slide. So they can't for them. So that's the beauty of the teeth, okay? So I'm gonna rotate, come back down. All right, there we go, okay? There's the bottom, all right, okay. Couple things about Vita teeth, okay? So 20 degree teeth, everything is knuckle tight and really tight together. So that in school, remember you had to do go in school and they, you had to go working and balance and then they would take that onion paper and check and tug on it to make sure that everything was touching and everything was perfect. Are you kidding me? That doesn't work like that in the mouth. Okay, so now, so what happens is when the patient opens their mouth and tries to chew, everything has to touch at the same time, not hit and slide into position so that the denture doesn't rock with 20 degree teeth. That's, that's impossible. And if it does, and if for some grace that everything can line up and touch, great. But in most cases, the teeth, 20 degree teeth, they mill because they're touched together from front to back, left to right. Everything's in contact. So the teeth mill the food. Well, to mill food, you can't do this to mill it. You have to go in and go side to side to mill it. We don't chew like that. I've shown you now four videos that show you don't do that. So we can identify the chew cycle. So again, how do you identify the chew cycle? Days of the week, months of the year, in English and a mother language if the patient speaks it. And then you're watching for the posturing of the jaw. Then you can document the chew cycle. Is it tapering? Is it ovoid? Is it more horizontal? And then you can make that notation for yourself so that you can manipulate the teeth in the articulator to mimic that movement in the mouth. And if you, and then you can also train your doctors, especially on the cases that you have ongoing right now that are driving you nuts. Because you probably have three or four cases in your office now as dental technicians that are driving you crazy. And they're back for multiple problems. Well, now this is your time to pick up the phone and educate the doctor and say, tell me about the chew cycle. Tell me about the person take a video of their chew cycle, send it to me. These are things now that you can do and switch the teeth out. So Vita teeth now, you're gonna notice that they have a larger cusp on one side than the other. This is the lower, so the fossa is here. So that's where the one millimeter-ish, okay? One millimeter, how so that now when the patient chews, they have a little bit of freedom to come in and touch. So that it's not a bullseye anymore, it is a helicopter pad. That creates the stability then, because you're trying to eliminate the hit and slide into position, okay? The hit and slide into position. I can increase that one millimeter 
by grinding the guiding planes. So now I can go in and grind the guiding planes here, open this up and actually increase my helicopter pad if I need to and turn it into a football field. When do I wanna do that? Well, patient has tremors, elderly patients, patients that dip their head forward and can't keep their neck straight, patients that, that, that are, are, are using walkers and wheelchairs, bent over, they have a hump in their back and I see that the, their spine is curved because then again, their head is dipping forward, it's gonna be harder for them to reproduce centric. So then I can go in and reproduce this, make it larger so that when they eat, it gives them a little bit more flexibility. I'm not grinding this. So this. This is the upper cusp. This is the grinder. So now you've heard me mention that dense supply teeth, they, this is mortal and pestle. So this is like, again, the teeth coming into a cup. So the upper cusp comes into the fossa and it crushes, crushes the food. Everybody, I spent the first 10 years of my career explaining to patients and coming up with silly excuses. So most patients had trouble eating lettuce and they would always come and go, I have trouble eating lettuce, I have trouble eating lettuce, I have trouble eating lettuce. And I, I, well, that's just dentures, I don't know. And then I realized, wait a minute, because when you try to mill and break a lettuce fiber apart, it doesn't break it apart. It just mushes it, but it doesn't break the fiber. Vita teeth break the fiber of lettuce and crush it. I do not get that complaint anymore since I've been using Vita lingual form teeth. Do not get that complaint anymore because Vita teeth crush the food like a mortar and pestle. They crush it. It's been a game changer for me, okay? and denture integration into the body. So what happens now is we have the chew cycle. So again, some chew cycles are gonna be more oval. Some chew cycles are more vertical. I don't know till I examine the patient. And if I can get that information from the doctor or from the patient, then what that's gonna do is tell me how to set the teeth, whether or not I, can, I need to adjust the guiding plane, I'm not doing those two to five adjustments in the chair at post insert. Now, Vita teeth, they also hold down, but you'll see that there'll be more gapping between them. The gapping is there to help hold the food onto the teeth to get crushed. If it's really tight, where does the food go? What well, gets pushed off? You need a little bit of gapping in there to let the food stay on it to get crushed. That's really important. So the brilliance about Vita teeth is that I can set them in lingualized occlusion where I have a little bit more of a tilt on the buckle. And I wanna do that say for patients that have a little bit more of a horizontal chew cycle. So I can tip that cusp out of the way, but I can also close it down and make it a little bit more like a 20 degree setup where I can come in and have a little bit more like a 20 degree setup but I have gapping and I have freedom to compensate for closing things together. So I can keep it somewhat closed or I can open it and tilt up. That's the brilliance of these teeth. They allow you to customize in all reality, a lot of times without touching them. So by the sheer fact that I can do this to them and they'll work in lingualized occlusion, or even if I take the teeth and, a lingualized tooth and bring it down into contact and act it more like a, a standard working and balancing tooth, it allows me that flexibility to do both. So it's fantastic. And now with Freedom and Centric, I can also take this and I can work within that helicopter pad. So I can take the upper, I can leave the lower where it is. And if I grind the guiding planes of these teeth, I actually can control even then where the upper is set. So I can work within that helicopter pad. It's brilliant. It allows me so much flexibility and freedom in that. So those are the big changes. The big things I wanted to, big points I wanted to say, it's a crushing tooth, it's a mortal and pestle tooth, it's not a milling tooth that we're used to. The teeth can be set in lingualized occlusion where the buccal cusp is up and more out of the way, 
but that creates more gapping, but I can also hold it down and close it together. Same thing will happen because it's not tight, not knuckle tight like we're used to, and it still gives me that freedom to work within that patient's chew cycle. Awesome. Model analysis. All right, I have oversized printed models here. Instead of working on a wee itty bitty model, okay? All right, so let's go through this quickly to show you the benefit of this. Okay, so we circle the incisive papilla. Bear with me. We draw a line vertically and then a line horizontally. So the vertical line gives us the true midline and skeletal midline of that patient. The horizontal line gives us the reference point of where the incisive edge of the uh, upper central incisor will be. So typically for us, it's seven to nine millimeters ahead of this point. So when you take a ruler and measure seven to nine millimeters ahead, the incisal edge will be resting there. So seven typically takes us to the inside part of the wet and dry line of the lip, and nine millimeters usually takes us to the outside wet and dry line of the lip. Now, why would I wanna do that? Well, okay, so seven is usually what we shoot for so that the teeth rest on the wet and dry line of the lower lip. But say I need to, for whatever reason, maybe push their lip out a little more, um, the, the orbicularis oris muscle is wrinkly and they, they want a little bit more um, uh, support behind the denture. Instead of making a really thick uh, wax up or a thick flange, and I can set the teeth to about nine millimeters, which is now cheating. And I'm going to just a little bit ahead of the wet and dry line of the lip. Not that I'm making them bucky beaver or twofold, but I've just gone to the other side of the wet and dry line of the lip to gently push the lip out with the teeth versus the wax. Uh, so they don't get a bump under the nose. So that's a pretty good tip that's worked well for me as well, okay? Second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna circle the long branch rugae. So the long branch rugae is the rugae generally right after the incisive papilla and you can follow it. And at the very end of it, you draw a dot. And you come across here and you draw a dot. And then what does that do? Well, that tells us, again, this is where the canine goes, or the, the upper cuspid, plus or minus one millimeter. So what actually is referencing, you can see this, is that central lateral cuspid. So that when I do the setup, I cut this out. So I'll cut it out of the wax so that I can see it. So when I set upper teeth later, I'll cut this area out and I can wax it up when I'm done so that I can see the papilla and see the rugae. So you can actually see the rugae point to the cuspid. So I know that the teeth are in the right position skeletally for that patient. So mother nature left us reference points. So I'm just using those reference points to say, okay, are my teeth in the right spot? Now, can you move them? Yes, you can. If for whatever reason somebody broke their nose or this or that happened, and sometimes we gotta we gotta skirt it a little bit around to make it work, okay, that's fine. This so we circle and we circle the tuberosities. Okay. Same thing here. Tuberosities, okay. Now, if you look on this model, it's actually pretty neat, okay? Because you can actually see the bumps. So that's where the cuspid went. You can see then first premolar, second premolar, molar, second molar. And actually, you can actually see the suture line of where the, uh, tooth was pulled and then this all was lost bone here this takes longer to resorb so the bone loss was on this side but that's actually the suture line or the center of where the tooth used to be in that socket 
it's pretty cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a ruler and we go from here. So that's our cuspid. And I'm going to draw it to the borderline here of the tuberosity and draw a line on my model. So what that does effectively is that's giving me a borderline. So from here to the inside part of the tuberosity and I draw a line on my model. So this is according to uh, Professor Gerber. So it's part of the Gerber technique. Okay, and we go to the outside and I draw a line on the base of the model. So let me draw that nicer for you. So what did that do? That gives me a triangle zone limit in here. So if you imagine now, that gives me a triangle. So according to Gerber, you can set teeth within this triangle and load them. And that's acceptable for this arch because it takes into, cons it takes into account resorption and it's popping the teeth into the best spot skeletally or bone way, bonely for the patient. Okay, so we do that left and right. So at the end, we're going to have these marks on the bottom of our model, okay? And then that gives us the zone limit. On the lower, dun, 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 okay, so now again, we're going to circle the retromolar pads. And I appreciate that there's probably a lot of giggles going on going, yeah, if I can ever see the retromolar pads. <laughs> So how do you fix that? Uh, so here's the thing. When you take a, there we go. When you, um, when you take an impression, way, you're taking it on compressed tissue. If you leave the denture out 15 minutes, 30 minutes, even an hour would be great. It allows the gum to rehydrate back up. And then all of a sudden, all these little landmarks are going to show up much better. So even if you can schedule it that the patient shows up an hour early and, and either can sit in your waiting room or sit in your treatment chair if you're not busy, or if they can leave their teeth out and then come to the office without their teeth in. Um, and, and it was certainly nice during the pandemic because then they had to wear a mask. So then nobody looks at them funny. Uh, and then they can come into the office without wearing the teeth so that when you take the impression, you're not taking it on compressed tissue. Because what does the denture do? It sits down, compresses the gum. So that's how you can get out of this and actually see these things after the fact is by that uh, and by leaving the denture out, please, for as long as you can. Even if it's 15 minutes, I'll take it because it's letting things rehydrate. Okay, so harder to see on this model, which is great. I'm looking for the freedom. Okay, so a lot of times, and what you want to do is you want to rock the model and do this. And a lot of times, then you can see where the freedom goes. Okay, it'll be really light, but you can just see it. Okay, and you have to do this to the model to see it. And then your eye picks it up. Typically, the, the buckle freedoms are just as the arch is starting to turn and direct itself posteriorly, okay? And there I'm going to draw a dot. And that's typically the location of the first premolars or the first bicuspids on the bottom. And then again, according to Gerber, I'm going to use that reference dot and I'm going to draw a line here using my Vita ruler, product positioning. From here to the outside part of the retromolar pad, and then to the inside of the retromolar pad. And then I'm gonna draw those lines on the back or posterior edge of the model. And I do that for both sides, okay? So according to Gerber, what that did, so we'll have lines there. Now, typically, we would set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge. And what Gerber is saying, and the Gerber philosophy is now, we have a triangle like this, okay? So we have a triangle, 
you can set teeth anywhere within this triangle and that's okay for the bone underneath because what do we see i don't see the bone i only see what's left of the rib shelf and bone under here that can still accept load and so that's the beauty of vita teeth is because remember i said that they are mortar and pestle what's important is that it's a point load system so it's awesome because again it's a point load tooth and now i have flexibility so i want to i want to ask you this question if i have a lower ridge there's my lower ridge and i set my lower tooth over top of the lower ridge because that's what school told me to do. And now the upper, well, the upper has to do, follow the lower, so it's gotta go there. It makes no consideration for where the upper tooth sits on the upper ridge, does it? None at all. I have a big problem with this. I don't set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge anymore. What? Are you nuts? Yeah, yeah, again, call me nuts. I don't set teeth over the crest of the lower ridge. I don't have to. Because now what happens is I've used anatomical landmarks to show me the best part of the bone and it gives me a triangle to work in. And then I'm able to adjust and move the teeth slightly. And with Vita teeth, it's a point load system. It's not milling where everything touches. That's why before, because dense supply teeth, there was contact everywhere on that tooth. It better be over the ridge to support it. Now that I'm point load, so Vita teeth are point loaded here in that fossa, I have more freedom and flexibility of where they can go over the ridge because I've identified anatomical landmarks of the mouth. Yep. How cool is that? So yeah, basically I'm disagreeing with everything that we hold dear to ourselves and what's taught in schools. Challenged myself and it works. So now if I need to drift over here a little bit, so long as I'm following the rules and staying within that triangle, I can take the teeth and drift them over. Why would I want to do that? No, pushing out the cheek more. Okay, person has a larger tongue. I can now modify instead of, well, you must sit over the ridge. And I use my voice, must sit over the ridge. I don't have to. No, you don't have to. Because I am now using model analysis, anatomical landmarks that I can now modify and make life better for me. So that's model analysis. It tells me where to put the teeth anatomically for that person that I'm working on. So it's, it's brilliant and it's been an eye opener for me and helping me. For people and that now it doesn't need to be so rigid. I don't have to sit over the ridge. I have a little bit of flexibility. I have a denture tooth that has flexibility. I'm using a denture tooth that has flexibility and has freedom and has movement to it, all based on building it for the patient, building it for them. So I want to share this with you. Okay. This is about denture integration into the body. I'm using a product now, Vita Teeth, that I can modify. So I've gone through now systematically and I've shared with you how they're built. They're not milling. They are point load system, mortal and pestle. So I've gone through now in detail with the PowerPoint and now showing you how I can take them and I can modify them to someone, okay? So now this is about denture integration into the body and patient care. So let me share some stories. I have a patient came into my office with a bag full of teeth and on a new patient consultation. What do they typically say? None of you guys know what you're doing, okay? Because he's got a bag full of So what happens is I start talking to this fellow. And during the course of that conversation, I start asking him questions. Well, what's wrong with these bag full of teeth? Well, they're not good. I can't eat with them. They're not comfortable. And I look at them and yeah, the bite's right. Oh yeah, bite's right. 
They're set over the crest of the lower ridge, everything that we were taught in school. And then I look at him and I start asking questions and I look at his tongue and his tongue is a little bit larger. It's a little bit more macro, right? It's a little bigger because I'm watching him. Now I'm getting him to speak days of the week, months of the year, cover the phonetics. If you had a second language, I'm asking him to speak in that language. And then I'm started asking him questions. Gee, sir, I notice uh, you wear your watch. Um, it's, it's one of those loose bands. You don't like a tight watch, do you? What does that have to do with teeth? actually quite a bit. Uh, do you like loose clothing? Do you like tight clothing? Could you wish you could wear sandals all the time and not a lace-up shoe? And he starts answering, yeah, uh, actually I like looser clothing. I don't like a tight shoe. Why don't you like a tight shoe? A lot of people, they, they want their shoe to fit on their foot and not move. Oh, I can't stand that. What do you mean? What, what can't you stand? Well, I can't stand the pressure. Okay. So then I start talking to him. Do you know what he admitted to me? he can feel a crumb in his bed when he goes to bed at night. So he actually every night has one of those little handheld vacuums and vacuums out his sheets. Now his wife was with him during this consultation because they're both frustrated because he's having trouble eating. This is impacting their quality of value of chewing. It's impacting it so much she's in the consultation as well because it's driving her nuts because this is a reoccurring problem. And so I said, wait a minute, you can feel a crumb in your bed. Yes, I can. I said, then you wonder why you have a bag full of teeth? Because he's so sensitive. He's hypersensitive to things. So now I start asking you this, are you going to open the vertical all the way that the textbook tells us to on this fellow? Are you gonna set teeth right over the crest of the ridge now seeing that he has a, a macro, tongue and things are a little bit larger and then I'm looking at his chew cycle I'm already thinking how do I build teeth for this guy to make it work for him remember I want something spicy remember spicy to me and spicy to you are two totally different levels of spice hot coffee to me and hot coffee to you are two totally different temperatures of coffee and temperature now I got to figure out what does this patient want this isn't about me this is about the patient this is about what do they want and then how am I going to get it there? So this was an eye opener where this fella comes and says these things. And then I could easily dismiss that as, ah, you're nuts. Well, no kidding. He has a bag full of teeth. But how do you make it now for him to work within those parameters of him? But now I, I address that with him, that they understand that. These teeth fit inside your body, sir. No kidding. They're going to drive you crazy because you're already sensitive. Now I've stuck something inside you. It's not a crumb on your sheet, it's inside your body. So now he's also learned to accept the limitations of that. These are things now that you can probe to your patients or your doctor on those cases that you have right now, those three or four cases that are driving you crazy. Start asking those questions. Who are we building this for? Because then I can take teeth and I can modify things. I would give that guy a ton of freedom. He needs a football field in there. Okay, he needs something that isn't going to rock and move and do this to the gum because then he's going to get irritated right away. Why? Because he can feel a crumb on his skin moving. So now you think that's any different inside his body? No, of course not. So now I need to give him lots of freedom so that it's not rocking. Don't lock the bite in. Maybe watch how much vertical you give him. Now I can drift off the ridge a little bit and give him more room for his tongue so it doesn't dislodge the denture. See where I'm going with this? This is about denture integration into the body. This is about understanding the patient. So we've set six anterior teeth. Okay. All right. Six anterior teeth. So what I did was I cut it away from the model. So I've cut the wax away and I've actually done this for display. You can see it a little easier. So again, I'll have my papilla here. Okay, so my papilla and then my rugae so that I can tell that it's pointing to the teeth so I know they're in the right position. This is what's so important, okay? So I can take the six anterior teeth, okay? So these are Vita Excel. Let 
let me take the pen out of here. There we go. Okay, a couple of things about this. So there's no neck, so it's customized wax up. So we don't put a neck on them anymore. Real teeth don't have a neck on them. So I can custom wax up. You have a long emergence profile, which means the teeth touch together. And, and then the papilla is only gonna be here on the very top quarter of the tooth, okay? So you don't show a lot of wax. Because what do people do at a wax try-in? They walk up to the mirror and they do this. I see wax. Holy jeez, do you walk around, you know, your house like just going, look at me. No, you don't. Yet, what do they do in the office? That's what they do in the office. So let's address that, okay, right away. All right, so you've got a long emergence profile, okay? The wax will only dip in on, on the first quarter or third of the tooth, depending on the tooth, okay? These are not mirror opposites of each other. They're made from acrylic glass. Even though they belong to the same mold, they're slightly different to help break up the light and not make it look as fake in the mouth, even though I set them pretty, okay? And quote unquote, straight. Now I've set, okay, I found my midline. So I'm six to seven, or sorry, seven to nine millimeters ahead. So this incisal edge here, okay, is seven to nine millimeters ahead of the center of the incisive papilla. I know then coming through that my canine is pointing to the long branch rugae. So I know that I'm skeletally in the right position for this patient, okay? Next thing I'm going to do is back up the camera. All right. So. Let me put this spot in. Okay. So for today's purposes, I've kind of cut, cut things out a little bit to, again, show you, okay? Right. So you can see it better on video because we're not in person yet. All right. So I've set up all the teeth. So what's going to happen is Vita teeth are going to do this. They're going to create a bow so you can see. See this archway here. This is a bow. So there's a natural curve to them. So so bow apex is here on the first molar to keep the cheek away, all right? So I've identified position. I've used model analysis to confirm position. So typically I'm gonna set the first premolar first for me. So the first premolar comes in first. The reason why I set the first premolar The first premolar, there we go. So the, the buckle, the mesial buckle cusp. So the buckle cusp, excuse me, the buckle cusp here. So I'll identify that. This is the buckle cusp marked in red. So that's right there. That goes into the mesial fossa of the upper first premolar. So what have I done? I've put, so it's mortal and pestle. So I've put the cusp tip into the fossa of the upper. So on lingualized occlusion, and according to Gerber, okay, he's gonna set the lower first, pardon me, he's going to set the upper first premolar and then the lower comes into it. And then that's what sets plane of occlusion for us. Okay. Now I finished the whole side of the setup so that you can see it's not knuckle tight. 
And then, as I had mentioned earlier, you have some flexibility here. So the nice thing from a setup perspective is this. So I can have the teeth down, meaning I can have the teeth, okay, fairly, fairly, not a lot of, not a lot of, of buckle tilt to it. So that then a doctor would look at this and, and see that it's quite, quite together, even though you can see there's spacing and it's not. Or I can heat this up and I, so that the buckle comes up even more out of the way. So why would I want to do that? Why would I want to take the tooth and push it and take that upper and move and increase the gapping? Well, say that the patient has a linear albicans, so that line on the side of their cheek, and it's catching them all the time, then I can use the buckle side of the tooth to help to help push, address and push that cheek out of the way. Or if the patient has a more vertical chew cycle, and then I know that they're gonna be catching the buckle cusps. So backing up a little bit, a lot of times people say to me, Mark, there are many questions that I feel people will say, how do you set these teeth, Mark? So there's a general setup guide out of Germany. And what you're going to notice when they do the general setup guide is you have to appreciate this was set up international standard for global audience. And on it, you're going to see that they use a string. Now I'm going to use an oversized one because we're on a camera. And then what they do is they take that string and then they go two thirds up the retromolar pad. So then your lower teeth are going to be almost touching or off, but you can see how I'm creating a curve of speed using a string. That's one way of doing it, okay? You also can take a curved template and I can use a template to set the teeth. So that's why the upper first premolar gets set first, then the lower, and then I can reference the template up two thirds or full retromolar pad coverage. So I typically set the lower posterior teeth first. What's gonna happen is for the first premolar, the buccal cusp touches, the lingual cusp is off the table, approximately one millimeter-ish. Then all of the other cusps, buccal and lingual, touch the template on a curved template. If you're working with a flat template, same thing will apply. The buccal cusp touches the flat template, the lingual cusp is off. Now what's gonna happen is you're gonna drift these down a little bit. So both buccal and lingual are now coming below your square template. And then this comes above the square template. So when you come to the second molar, that's now drifting above. So what I'm getting at is these teeth can be set at multiple variations. They can be set with a string. They can be set on a curve template. Typically, you can set the, as I said, I set the lower posterior teeth first, but you actually can set all of the upper teeth and use a flat template. So now using this as a flat template, because it's nice and oversized for us. Okay. Same thing applies if you set all of your upper teeth. That looks very similar to a standard 20 degree setup that you're already doing and using. Okay. So again, the buccal cusp touches, the lingual cusp is slightly off. Now the lingual cusp touches and the buccal's off. Lingual cusps touch, remember the distal's slightly off, but the buckles are now off the template. This is totally off. So it's very similar to a 20 degree setup. So it, it shouldn't impact your ability to switch over to these teeth 
and set them. Because I want you to basically set them the way you set them already. Just don't knuckle tight them. Because you're not going to get it. There's only so much I can force these together. Okay. There's only so much I can force these together. There is going to be gapping. Okay. And the gapping is good. Because remember the chew cycle. That's important. So now you can set all of the upper teeth first. That's fine. I don't do that. I set to the first premolar here, then the bottom, then I set my lower teeth. Because then that lets me see where I am in relation to my model analysis of the lower ridge and where I am. Not over the crest of the ridge, but to my model analysis markings and where I'm at and where I want to go. So I don't have to, and I can drift off the ridge if I want to, based on so long as I'm over those. Okay. Based that I'm over those markings. And then again, it's not a knuckle tight, it's freedom and flexible in there. Okay. So even though I, I have that ability with these teeth, it's, they're fantastic. So remember, I can have them together, like again, like what we're used to with 20 degree teeth, okay? But you saw a little bit of gapping. Or if I need to, I can take it and rotate it and lift it up more lingualized, exposing this cusp more, okay? This is the driver part, okay? So this is the cutter. So remember I said mortal and pestle? So that's the hammer. That's what's going to crush things right there. And then on the lower, it's this one here. It's the first premolar on the bottom, okay? That's the, the cutter. And then those teeth are going to rest into the fosses. So the fosses are here. Okay. So on the top, it's the mesial. And now on the bottom, it's going to be here. Here, 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 and here. That's where they rest into. Now, from a chew perspective. So remember now I said with... 20 degree teeth, everything has to touch, everything's touching at the same time. So now you have to imagine that that's how it has to work in the mouth all the time for it to work. And patients will tolerate it or they're gonna use glue. Meaning that when this is going, 20 degree teeth, everything's touching together and it's milling it. And now I'm saying you don't need to do that anymore. You don't need to have that, okay? Because it's a chew cycle, okay? So now, how to identify the problems? Now when the patient is speaking and I'm identifying their chew cycle. So now I'm looking to see about any hits here. So this is the freedom cusps. So they're buccal upper lingual lower. So we were taught by dent supply setups that you want contact on those buccal upper lingual lowers. Now I've changed my mindset and theory and I don't. I want those guys clear so that then when the patient chews, when the patient chews, remember, oh, Mark, my bite's right. Yep. So how do we check this on an articulator? We typically do this. We typically open and we typically do this. Now, out of those videos that I showed you, all four videos, did anyone do anything remotely looking like this? Did they? Nope. Nobody gives us remotely what, that, what we're doing here in the lab. I want you to take your articulator, and I don't care what kind of articulator you have because you can use it on any of them. I've done them on little hinge clip-clop articulators to these fancy cable ones. I want you to open it up and I want you to mimic a chew cycle. What's that patient doing? 
Now, of course, the upper is going to move instead of the lower mandible in real life. But now think of those videos that I And now what am I doing is I'm trying to pretend to move the articulator in the motion of that patient. And I'm trying to look at it and see, are the cusps clearing? Are they moving? Are they hitting? How is it working? Is it coming forward when they posture out to that side? And now that I've colored them, and I've colored them with the pen, what do you see? You can see marks. Look, the red hit here. The red hit. So that's a hit and slide. Hit and slides are bad. So now I know for that person, I can clear that out a little bit. So the question is, Mark, what kind of pens are you using? Dun, dun, dun. I'm using Statler, non-permanent. Made in Germany. Woot, woot. Okay. Statler. So you can get these at at office supplies companies. You can also uh, use Sharpies. Just make sure it's non-permanent, please, okay? So that this wipes off with a, with a wet towel, okay? So that, that works, okay? So something wet, it'll come off, okay? So that's how you can check it in the lab. So those patients that I showed you the videos on, I've taken those and customized it where I can tip the buckle cusps up now, and I can get a little bit more gapping in there because I know that they need the space. Or I can leave things more down. I can leave it more down, but then I'm manipulating the articulator. And now I'm going through the motions and I'm checking to see if there's marks. Now, why am I not using articulating paper? Because this is paper, even the, even the thin stuff, even the silk that you can get it still bends between the teeth and it gives you a wrong reading. Whereas using the pens, it's just the pen and the ink and the tooth touching. You're not ever gonna be bending or crackling the paper between the teeth. You never ever use these in the mouth because the minute you shove this in, it moves the tongue back because this touches the tongue and the tongue goes back. You've just manipulated the position of the mandible and your bite's gonna be wrong. And then you say, touch your teeth together and tap. Remember, Mark, you idiot, they don't feel their teeth touch together. So no offense to any other Marks listening. I'm talking about me, Mark. Okay, you can't feel your teeth touch together. And then now they've their tongue is moved. So you don't ever use these in the mouth, ever, ever, ever. And you never use uh, calipers or, or whatnot and put it in there and shove their cheek. Because now you've manipulated and you've pushed the cheek out of the way to insert this in and you've said, bite, 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 tap, tap, tap. Again, you've put in another response into the central nervous system and they can't, it's bug sensory overload to them. So how do you check this in the mouth? Okay, I'll show you. So one moment, please. I need to get some water. Okay. So I'm going to take this off. So this will serve our purpose. Okay. All right. I've got a Q-tip. I've coated the end of the Q-tip or the cotton swab in Vaseline. I'm going to take it and I'm going to color the Q-tip using the ink from the articulating paper. And now I'll take the dentures out of the mouth I'll dry them, and then I'm going to go in there and I'm going to color the cusps or whatever I'm looking for. Okay, I can color these too. Okay, and I'm using the ink from the articulating paper. And I can go in and color. And then I'm going to insert that in the mouth. And then what am I going to do? As All those videos. That's how I've done this. And then I want you to say days of the week, months of the year, and I just want them to go through and live their life and talk and function, okay? 
days of the week, months of the year. And when I'm done with that, we usually just talk about the weather or sports. Okay, because I'm right now in Edmonton. So, of course, we talk nothing but the Edmonton Oilers and hockey. Okay. And even little old ladies can talk hockey. And we get them to move. And then what am I doing is then I can take that out of the mouth. And then I can look and I can say, look, see, hitting the guiding planes. And then I adjust it. So you never adjust the cutter. Don't adjust these, these are the pulverizers, okay? I can adjust the guiding planes, the bowl that the cusp sits in. That's what I touch and then I can adjust that for the person. And then remember, I don't have to polish after because it's acrylic glass, okay? Or if I need to, I can come up here and touch these as well. Because sometimes if you color these, you actually can see, it'll mark the actual ink away and you'll actually see where the line is and where it, where it hit. Remember, they can't tell you that because they can't feel it. So that's how you check it in the mouth and that's how you check it in the lab. So what we've done is we've now have our setup. So we've talked about, we can set the upper teeth first, you can set the lower first, use the setup technique that you square template or flat template to a round template. I've showed you just now, the biggest thing is to understand that it's not knuckle tight locked together and that it's the main cusp. So that cutter cusp, especially here on the first molar, this, this guy right here sits in this fossa and crushes things, okay? And then it crushes it within a pattern, within a chew cycle so that you have to clear away all of the perimeter as required for that person, okay? So that's the big deal here. So these teeth are sharp, they're effective, they cut and mince lettuce. Now, next, how much overbite overjet do you do? So typical rule of thumb is I'll hear as I travel globally, one to one, two to two. So it's basically one to one, two to two. And then I pose the question, well, why? Why is it one to one, two to two? Because, uh, because why? Why is it one to one, two to two? Well, that's what my boss told me. That's what the school told me. Because uh, that's how we've always done it. So how do I know that that patient's one to one, two to two? Remember the, the lady, it would be the second video where she was saying the days of the week and then she had that funny jaw movement at the very end. And I told you, I have like four millimeters of overbite on that case. Everything that the textbook tells me it shouldn't work, works for her because her jaw opens and postures so much. You don't, how do I know it's one to one, two to two is I need to look at the patient. Now, if I can't look at the patient, okay, so you're going to go one to one, two to two, and then you're going to check it same way. Okay, so what I do is I'll typically take a pen and I'm going to color the incisal edge here, and then I will come down. And then I can move the articulator and facilitate movement days of the week, Monday, Tuesday. And I'm just, again, I'm not doing the articulated movements and I'm not going end to end. I'm just letting the cusps and everything guide it for me. And then I'm looking to see if any blue has transferred to the incisal edge here of the upper and I'm looking in that area there okay hello autofocus okay let's take the light out and I'm looking to see if it's marking anywhere in here okay so for all the denturists out there I customize my overbite and overjet to the patient for the dental technicians out there that are listening okay go one to one two to two but then I'm not looking for What? No end to end? No, no end to end. Mark, are you off the funny farm? What, 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 what? Yeah, I'll tell you what. No denture patient brings their teeth together and goes end to end when they bite into a sandwich. That doesn't happen. What's happening is they're taking their teeth 
and they're bringing them forward so the jaw posture is forward but what happens so i'm telling you on a public forum i don't go end to end so here's the upper tooth okay what happens is they bring their lower okay they bring their lower up and instead of going end to end to get into that sandwich they're bringing it up and it touches here okay it touches on this aspect of the tooth here and that's what they use to then rip and tear the food away they're not going end to end to cut into the sandwich they're actually coming up and rests here because that's what we do with natural teeth it comes here so I just have to make sure all the cusps and everything support that the tooth comes and rests there. Okay, so how I do that is again, the tooth will come and not go end to end. And again, focus, it's much easier to see in person. Okay, that I'm touching and I want it to hit. If it's going to hit, I want it to go right in there. Okay, because that's where they're gonna go and touch and then tear the sandwich. Again, game changer for me, repositioning teeth of what I thought I was supposed to be doing. And now that's where I go. So even on that case that I have four to five millimeters, okay, I have, I have four to five millimeters of overbite. I have all that freedom, but I make sure that when she postures forward, that's where the hit is. And I've left her in that position. So now her central nervous system learns the pattern and now it's working for her. So I'm actually able to build a denture with, with over four millimeters of overbite in it that technically shouldn't work, that does. Because I've given her freedom, I've given her a, a bunch of wiggle room, because remember freedom is good, and I'm shooting to end that incisal edge here instead of end to end. And that's how we can check it, okay? So we're rolling near the end of the of of the uh of the presentation i wanted to show you a powerpoint to talk about the theory and it's not 1950s anymore everybody it's it's time to use teeth that allow you to again shape them to the patient and be their superhero uh, again you're not Adjust it, but it's never, never knuckle tight. There's slight gapping, there's, there's a little bit of flexibility. And the reason why is so you control the hit and slide. You're trying to prevent the hit and slide. And then you check it using pens instead of articulating paper so that the articulating paper doesn't bend and give you an erroneous or incorrect reading. And then you can do the Q-tip or cotton roll, or excuse me, cotton swab and using Vaseline and then checking it in the mouth by coloring the cusps, reinserting it, and then having the patient speak. We've gone through model analysis that shows me where skeletally the teeth are in the correct position for that person to that degree. We've discussed now about the flexibility of not setting over the ridge using, again, the Gerber technique to show me the triangle that I can work in so that I have a little bit of flexibility. We've talked about the teeth, that they're not, again, a milling tooth. Vita teeth are a mortal and pestle, and they crush. And they crush the tooth and then open into the chew cycle and then come in and crush again. They're not milling it, because the milling is what rocks and is manipulating the denture. So game changers for me in my professional career, and again, why I I'm dedicated to lecturing and putting myself out there and my ideas out there is to lift us up and make us better. So, Jim, do we have questions now that I can answer? Yes. Now, yes, as this, actually, we do have quite a few. Uh, so let me will, uh, go through a few things yeah. first. So this will still work in balance, everyone? Yeah, I can take this articulator and, and everything will work in balance. But remember, I'm not doing these types of motions with the articulator anymore. I'm lifting it up and I'm facilitating a chew cycle, letting the teeth glide through the chew cycle of a person. Okay? All right, Jim. 
All right. So uh, just just a reminder uh, that we are going to uh, record this. This has been recorded, and so that you can revisit it if you want to uh, on our websites and gain information. Anything you miss, you can review uh, yourself uh, on any of our websites, uh, Vita North America YouTube and so forth. So give us a day or two, and that will be posted. Your CE, remember, your, we get a lot of questions on CE. You're going to get an email from us. If not, just uh, email our education department at uh, education at B to North America, and we can get you those uh, that CE uh, number. We don't give the uh, certificates itself. We get all your information, and we submit them to NBC or send you a letter if that's what's uh, required. So we also are available here to help you if you have any follow-up questions from the VITA side. Uh, Mark has uh, graciously shown earlier the list of all of our representatives out in the field. This is the help desk, uh, myself and Paul. Uh, we can help you out as, as well. This is, uh, again, the list of uh, sales reps that we have that Mark showed earlier. Please contact us. Uh, and if you're interested in different types of uh, programs, you know, Mark, you did a great job on the model analysis, showing us how you went through step by step the process, which is very interesting. And uh, really, we can always use Refresher and understand different concepts so we can meld our, what we do every day along with someone uh, like yourself, what you do. So we have, uh, if you're interested in like in a class three setup, uh, June 17th, we have scheduled with Mark. Uh, another webinar, another program, which would be really fantastic because we get a lot of calls on uh, how to set up with their different various uh, occlusal schemes. And then we have the combination syndrome, that's July 13th. And then we have various others throughout the year. So please join us and you can get a full list uh, of those at Vita North America Education. Uh, this is Mark's information if you need to uh, capture it real quick. and get uh, that going, you know, give him a call, uh, give him a shout out. Uh, Email me. You know, he's uh, give me very some open to, to receiving calls and help you out. So that's that's nice of, uh, of Mark. I appreciate it. And then as far as uh, questions go, let's get to that quickly. So we have, uh, so this is a question on uh, when the patient presents without dentures, Usually they'll have an old set or something. How do you determine that type of chew cycle if the patient doesn't have any uh, existing dentures, I, I would assume? Mm. Yes, they're or, chewing with their tongue. So now their tongue is yeah. rolling the food and mashing it against the palate. So hook with them. So mash it yourself. You hook your home. You're going to see it's going to be very horizontal. So I've actually brought in patients that have been edentulous and had food brought in, um, and they've chewed for me. And typically, you're going to see that that's going to be more horizontal. So right away, they're they're taking their tongue and they're milling the food against their palate, or they have a very if they're using their ridge at all to contact, it's going to be a very horizontal pattern. So then when you make teeth, you have to put it very horizontal and I give them a ton of freedom. So I'm grinding the guiding planes. Again, you got to grind the guiding planes. You can do that with. Or someone that um, someone that uh, again has really worn down dent dentition, they're going to be milling it because their teeth are flat, and they're going to be milling. And that was the biggest catch for me. Why does the new set fit looser than the old one? Well, when you examine the old one, they're chewing more horizontal. And then I set up 20 degree teeth back in the day locked them in together sure they worked in balance 
but it didn't work in that horizontal chew pattern for them because the teeth couldn't because they were touching together and moving. So when I started to figure that out for myself, get out of 20 degree teeth and into Vita teeth with freedom, and I was able to do this and then mimic that more for them, a oh, man, I'm telling you, the adjustments rates plummeted and denture integration and acceptance went up. So again, if they're without teeth, or if the dentition is really worn down, it's going to be more horizontal. Okay? So then you need to accommodate. All right. Because why? The central nervous system learned a pattern. They've been doing it for years. You think they're just going to forget that pattern? No. That pattern's in here. So now when you change that pattern, you got to give them time to figure out that pattern. Remember, there's no nerve to the denture. They can't feel it directly. So that's why it takes time. Or you make that accommodation right away for them to help manage it. Okay, Jim, next one. Sometimes we have to reprogram them. Yep, correct. So um, next question is, if, uh, if you don't have the uh, length of the arch on the posterior, if you have to remove one of the teeth, which individual tooth do you remove uh, when you can't accommodate all four posteriors? This, the second premolar, the second bicuspid. Take that one out. You want the molars in because the molars are bigger. They have a bigger bowl and a bigger antagonist to come in and crush. So drop the second bicuspid or the second premolar always. Okay? Right. And then if that doesn't hey, work. If... Sorry, Jim? No, go ahead. I was going to say, if that doesn't work, then use two second molars because they are a little smaller, but they still have that girth to them. So use two second molars or three second molars, whatever it takes to fill the space, but you want the, the largest surface area possible. All right. So if the, if the, Teeth do not have a slight centric move movement or what you call freedom of centric. Okay. How does this affect the patient? If it doesn't have, <clears throat> right. So if we're going to use um, yeah, so that lock a in. product that there's you no know, freedom lock centric. In. So again, how does that affect the patient? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what happens is, okay, so two things are going to happen. One, they tolerate it. So they've learned to accept that the denture rattles and moves and they live with it. Okay. So it's like when your socks, you've worn them a long time and now they don't, they, the, the elastic goes and they start sliding down your leg and you just, you deal with it, you deal with it and you adapt and you adapt because ah, that's what the patient does. They adapt to it and they accepted it or the, uh, or the reverse to that is the patient does not and they're back in your office complaining. The fact is, is that, again, there's a handful of teeth on the planet that have freedom and centric only. All the rest, so all 95 or 99% of the rest are all locked together. So the patient will, will again, it's impossible to consider that they're going to bullseye centric every time. They've learned to accept the rattle and the movement as it is what it is. They've just accepted it. But with that comes the the glue usage, the adhesive usage, with that comes all of the complaints I've listed before that you deal with on a regular basis with patients. When you eliminate that lock-in and you put in freedom, those complaint levels drop, the, the adhesive use drops, okay, and the soft lining use drops. Again, first 10 years of my career, I got really good at saying, come on, Mrs. Smith, it's a denture. It is going to be loose. It's the best we can do. I don't say that anymore. I look at them and say, look, okay, we're going to crack this open and let's let's examine you and let's get this so that you don't have to wear adhesive anymore. Been very successful at it. All right. Yeah, um, the question is, uh, if you have uh, use a digital denture, do you, do you use the same technique for a digital denture setup? Yes. Yeah. So we manufacture and I work with uh, the Vito, v, pardon me, Vita, Vigo. 
So um, on the three shape software, or you can use the ExoCAD software, same thing, it doesn't matter. Um, so the teeth are based, so Vita Digital is based on the lingo form that I showed you today. So it's the same platform with Freedom. It comes with Freedom and Centric already digitally. So digitally, although at the moment we're not able to, with the software, grind the guiding planes, I'm going to have to do that manually. That technology is coming. We're eventually coming. But at the moment, I've got about a millimeter of freeway. And then the computer sets it up perfect for me. And if I want to, then I can tip the teeth and the buckle cusps manually out of the way a little bit. And I've done that. And it works. All right. Um, the uh, question is, uh, do you always use uh, balance occlusion or, or is that per patient specific? Is there a certain <clears throat> method of occlusion okay, so, function? Yeah. So, so the, okay, so I use Vita Lingo form 99% of the time and digitally it's, it's the Vigo. So that's based on the Lingo form as well. So it's, it's basically all the same occlusion all the time, but modified slightly. So with that said, yes, the major, uh, the 99% of my cases have real time working and balancing occlusion to some degree then you're correct in your question to say, I do modify it to the patient. So that patient that has that four millimeters of overbite that I put in there, I can only move things so much before the teeth hit. So I've got some degree of working and balancing a contact, but I knew for that person with their teardrop and their motion, I gave them a lot of freedom this way to work so they can line up. So that was that patient that was posturing out to their left after they would speak. That's that case. So yes, it's all lingualized occlusion to some form, and it's all, again, modified to that person. Correct. All right. And then we have a question on, uh, just to clarify, you set up your uh, first premolar first, and then your, your upper posteriors on one side first. Yes, so, so and then I would go to the lower. Now, I'll tell you how I, how I set it, and if you come to a manual course, how I would set it. Six anterior teeth, then the upper first premolars, then the lower first premolar to set the height. Then I set the left and right lower posterior teeth. Then I set the upper posterior teeth, and then the lower anterior teeth last. All right. That's how I do it. Excellent. Excellent program uh, webinar. That's it on the, the questions. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Mark, it was an exceptional, as always, uh, a great presentation, a lot of information we can thank all you. use. We don't slap teeth together. We're superheroes to a patient. Whoop, whoop. Okay. And remember, freedom is good. The biggest thing I can share with you today is put that freedom back in it. It's going to help you so much. Great. Well, I appreciate it again, Mark. Uh, again, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please visit us on our website. You can revisit the recording as well on the Vita North America website. And as I previously mentioned, uh, Mark has several uh, additional webinars that we're going to be doing in the next several months. So please catch uh, Mark, and soon we will be in person mm. out in the real world, which would be excellent. So I want to thank you again, Mark, for your time yes, and your and effort here. My pleasure. And sorry for interrupting. Please reach out to me. Uh, you've, Jim has posted my contact information, so send me an email or a text. I'm here to support you. I'm here to support you with your treatment planning. Uh, and, and again, the, the Vita is here to support you with, with that and your treatment planning and with questions. So just please be forgive me. I may take a day or two to get back to you. Um, but with that said, we're here to support you. And if I can't get you that in a timely manner, then, then Jim or Paul can. But we're here to support you through it. So again, we, we've gone through, listen to it again, there was a lot of points um, and specific points about the product and about why it, it's worked so well for me and why I'm such an advocate for it now because it's made my life so much better, uh, my professional life so much better. So th you know, I thank Vita at Sanofabric for that and then understanding how I can take and manipulate their product and, and then uh, train them on how to manipulate their product 
and now train you on how you can manipulate that product to suit the patient. So again, please contact me as required. Thanks very much. My pleasure to, to be of assistance and thank you for your trust and for your time. All right. Well, this will end the uh, today's um, Vita Learning webinar with Mark Wagenseal. I hope everyone has a great day wherever you are. Thank you very much. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Woo -hoo.